Hey, welcome back to our series we've called Reset, and I want to welcome all of our friends at our Coweta campus, our Sepulpa campus, those of you that are viewing online, thank you for being a part of this. If you've got a Bible or if you've got uh, a way you can pull up a Bible app, uh, go ahead and do that. Turn to Romans 14 or click to Romans 14, whatever you need to do. Uh, if you've got the notes section with us, it's uh, included in your bulletin that you were handed when you came in, go ahead and grab that, be ready to take some notes, and uh, we're going to jump right right into things. When, when you became a Christian, this is what we've been talking about from Romans 12 through the end of the, end of the uh, book of Romans. When you became a Christian, God, he has taken you on a journey of change. And so all kinds of areas of your life has been changed. You have beliefs that have been changed. They are different from what you believed before you became a Christian. There are behaviors that you uh, engage in that are different than, or that you don't behave, that, that you don't engage in, that are different than what you were as a Christian. There are attitudes that you have that are different than what you were when you became a Christian or before you became a Christian. You're not the same as you were before you became a Christian. You don't believe like you used to. Uh, you your lifestyle looks different. Your actions are different. And so there are some things that you used to do that you don't do anymore. That was just a regular part of your life. And you became a Christian and maybe immediately or over the course of a time, there were some things you said, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to put that behind me. I'm not doing that anymore. There are some things also that you used to not do before you became a Christian. You never did this, but you became a Christian. And now this is a, a part of your life. It's a part of the habits that you have. This is stuff that you do all the time. And this is what happens to us. I mean, this is, this is just kind of natural. This is what, it, it, what happens. We tend to look around. We became a Christian. We tend to look around. We go, wait a minute. There's some stuff that I stopped doing for Jesus. And yet there's still some people or there's some people in our church and they are still doing that. They're, they're still doing those. I gave those things up. And there's some people that are still doing them. And so you become a crusader for whatever it is that you stop doing. And you think everybody else ought to stop doing it. You stop doing it. And, uh, you know, they, it was important to you. You think everybody else ought to stop doing that same thing. Or maybe you started doing something. After you became a Christian, you started doing something. You'd never done it before. That was really not a part of your life. You think everybody should start doing it. Everybody should ought to have this habit. Everybody ought to read their Bible. Everybody Everybody ought to do it this way. And now you're on a crusade to make everybody else do what you're doing. And I just want you to hear this for a minute. That is not healthy Christianity. That's not what God wants from us as Christians. That's not what we want at Cedar Ridge. In fact, there, there are certain things that, uh, that we believe, certain things that we talk about at Cedar Ridge. They're the non-negotiable things. We've got them listed in a faith statement. They're things that are absolutely non-negotiable type things. They're right out, right out of the Bible. Those are the things that, that we, we believe, and those are the things that we want, want to practice. On the other hand, there are a whole lot of other choices that we're just going to see differently and that's okay. Christianity is not about rules, right? We've talked about that. It's not about the rules. It's not about keeping the rules. It's not about, you know, the things that you do and the things that you don't do. Christianity is all about relationships. In fact, it's about a relationship with Jesus. That's what the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans is all about. Because of what Jesus did, he justified us. But then these last few chapters, we've been talking about the relationship that we have with the people around us and especially the Christians around us. And so Paul wrote this letter. That's what it is. It's not a book. It's a letter he wrote 2,000 years ago to Christians living in first century Rome. Now remember, the church in Rome is a multi-ethnic, uh, I mean multinationality kind of a place. This is the capital of the world at the time. So there are Christians there that have Jewish background. There are Christians there that have Gentile or non-Jewish background, all kinds of pagan background. And so there are some real life situations in first century church life that Paul is addressing. In fact, there's some hot button issues. There are people that are arguing and getting into conflict. They're fighting over some of these issues in the first century Roman church. And Paul is addressing them. And here's the thing. It's cutting edge relevant for us today. 
Let's back up for just a minute. In chapter 13, Paul told us how we have been reset when it comes to dealing with, with you know, governing authorities, that we have been reset from rebellion to respect. I mean, that, that, is, that is practical stuff for us today because we still do with that. We, we still, do, still argue about it within the church, and we talk about politics, and you know, we think people ought to believe one thing, and, 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 and Paul reminds us that, listen, it's God that's in control. Even when it comes to our communities, the gospel, we said, resets us from just leaving those people and kind of withdrawing our, to ourselves, uh, that, that we don't leave, that we love them. And again, it's so, so practical for our church, for Cedar Ridge today. We're going to find the same thing here when we go through the 14th chapter of the book of Romans. So I hope you have it up. We're going to jump right in. Romans chapter 14, verse 1, Paul says, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters okay we're just going to start right there except the one whose faith is weak now when he's talking about you know weak he's not talking about like a weaker christian that's not that's not the idea it doesn't necessarily mean like a new christian that really doesn't know their way around uh he's just saying except the one who's weak the weak are in fact generally the most fervent most diligent in trying to please jesus they're, they're the ones that are often trying the hardest, but where they're weak often is in the remnants of a legalistic spirit that still kind of clings to them. The implications of the gospel, again, that we read about in the first 11 chapters of Romans, it really has not all been worked out for them. And so there are sometimes uh, Christians that just struggle with that. They become the weaker person. In fact, sometimes, I, let me be honest, I'm the weaker person. Sometimes that's me right there because I struggle in error. We shouldn't be doing this. This is something. Why, why, why are people doing that? Why are people not doing this? And I want to jump back to a legalistic time in my life, and I want other people to behave and to do and to feel and believe like I do. And so sometimes I struggle with that. I'm the weaker person. Paul says, listen, let's accept one another, especially the person whose faith is weak, and let's stop quarreling, let's stop fighting over disputable issues. So if you're taking notes with me, let's say this, for followers of Jesus, there are indisputable and there are disputable matters. There's both indisputable matters and there's disputable matters matters. And what Paul does over this chapter is he gives us some of some examples of things that were going on in the first century church in Rome that really are still pretty relevant, surprisingly relevant for us today. Look what he says in verses 2 and 3. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. In this case, Paul says there were people in the first century church in Rome, some of them were vegetarians, and some of them were meat eaters. There were some Christians in the Roman church who had Jewish background, and they chose not to eat meat, and the big reason was because there was a good chance that any meat that they would be able to buy had been sacrificed to idols. And so if they were to eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols, that would go against everything for them in worshiping the one true God. And so they refuse to do that. We're going to just be vegetarians. We're not going to be meat eaters. And so in this case, there were those who were abstainers. They would not eat meat. And then there were those who didn't care, didn't think it was a big deal, had the freedom to do it. They were participators. And you know what, that's maybe uh, uh, a little more relevant than we think even today. There are people who uh, refrain from eating meat. In fact, there's a lot more of them uh, uh, these days, and it's not all because of diet and health. Sometimes there are genuine concerns there. Sometimes it's over the industry, concern over the industry, or the inhumane treatment of animals. And often, sometimes it's based on people's faith. They, they have a reason for that. There are some who eat meat, and there are some who don't. For those who participate, Paul says, don't treat with contempt those that don't. There is a tendency for those who have the freedom to do things to look down on those who don't have that freedom. Paul's saying, be cautious there. 
At the same time, those who abstain aren't to judge those who go ahead and eat the meat. In fact, a natural response for the more restricted perspective is that you would condemn those that, you know, don't see it your way, that seem to enjoy, you know, the freedom of of doing it. And so we shouldn't do that, Paul says, because we have been welcomed in Christ. God has accepted us in Christ. If that's the case, Why would we judge or why would we despise one another on disputable matters that really don't make a difference? There's more important things for us to worry about, Paul's saying. And so that's one way. Uh, There were the meat eaters and the vegetarians. It had to do with diet. There's another uh, example of this that Paul gives, and it has to do with the observance of religious holidays. This is what he says in verses 5 and 6. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and give thanks to God. And so in verses 5 and 6, we see some people have differences when it comes to, uh, to holidays, specifically religious holidays. Again, some of these Christians had Jewish background, and they were having a hard time of letting go of their religious past. They they kept the Sabbath. That's, they, they'd done that all their life. And so it was just a habit for them. And they would look around and go, why, why, why is it everybody keeping a Sabbath day, the seventh day, a day of rest, a day of war? Why, why, why aren't you people doing that? In fact, there's probably good reason. There's a good argument for all of us to have a day of Sabbath, maybe not a, a religious one, but for them it was certainly both of those things. They kept the Sabbath. They kept the other Jewish holidays. Now, Some of those Christians were people of more pagan background, and the holidays that they had known as religious holidays were absolutely pagan festivals. And so when they became a Christian, they said, we're not going to have anything to do with those pagan rituals, those pagan religious holidays. They turned their back on them, and they thought any religious holiday was bad. It was unchristian. And so you can imagine in in the first century church, they they were literally getting into fights over this of whether or not to keep religious, uh, religious days like this. And Paul says, listen, every day is a day that the Lord has made. Every day is a day that the Lord's made. Now, you may be thinking, that that sounds like some old ancient stuff, and that's not even relevant today for us. But it absolutely is, because in our church, there are are people who who practice these things, specifically holidays, differently. In our church, there are people that celebrate uh, Christmas and and, uh, have ideas about how it should celebrate about doing it and how it should be celebrated. And then there are people that are like, eh, we put too much of an emphasis on that. I don't think we ought to do that. I don't think that's a, the, the godly way of think, thinking. In fact, I, I'll get an email every once in a while that says, Preacher, don't you know that December 25th was, a, was an original pagan holiday and it's just kind of a day that Christians took over. So every time you celebrate Christmas, you're really celebrating a pagan holiday. And so, you know, I... I I'm kind of just of the matter that we actually took it back and, and uh, you know, we've redeemed it. Uh, there, there are people that, you know, say uh, we, we, we should never talk about Santa Claus at Christmas. In fact, you know, what, you know what, what it spells if you rearrange the letters of Santa. And so there are people that have differences in opinions. Uh, there are differences in opinion in things like Halloween. There are some in our church that don't want uh, their kids or their family to participate in events that we might might schedule on October 31st and so there are people in our church that don't participate there are many of them that do whether it's a trunk or treat or a block party which by the way we're not celebrating Halloween we are redeeming a night that is unlike any diff- any other night where there are families walking around in neighborhoods and we're just looking to engage them uh, with the gospel and so there are those that in our church who who maybe don't participate in that there are abstain and there are participators and Paul says don't look down on the other 
In fact, those are the two big issues, the meat, uh, meat eaters and vegetarians and the religious holidays. But in verse 21, Paul actually addresses to, uh, the idea of drinking alcohol. He, he's, he talks specifically about drinking wine. And so again, in our church, there are abstainers when it comes to wine or alcohol, and there are participators. We have both. And that's fine. In fact, it's fine. And it's just like the church in first century Rome. They are, all of these things are examples of disputable matters. Now, if, if you're an abstainer, maybe you don't eat meat, maybe you don't drink alcohol, maybe you don't go trick-or-treating, Paul says, do it as to the Lord. If you do participate, Maybe you eat vegetables and you eat meat and the more rare the better on your meat. And if you have a glass of wine and if you celebrate Christmas and your wife makes you put on pajamas and take a family Christmas picture, you do it to the full extent. Paul says, do it as to the Lord. Don't quarrel. Don't fight over disputable matters. Which also implies that there are some indisputable matters, right? There's some things that, you know, are, are things that, that are, not, again, non-negotiables. Like, Jesus is the Son of God. Like, Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus was crucified. Jesus was resurrected from the grave. The Bible is our complete authority. There are some, some indisputable matter. And quite honestly, there are some actions and behaviors that are indisputable. Like we find in the Ten Commandments, things like, you know, don't steal, uh, don't murder someone, don't commit adultery. Those are things that are not in question. Those are things that we don't just like, well, you know, you need to decide what's right for you. No, no, no. These are, these are indisputable matters. In the indisputable matters or in, in, the, in the disputable matters, it's a matter of, of conscience. And in fact, in verse 5, Paul didn't say that it doesn't matter those disputable matters he says we ought to be convinced fully in our mind fully convinced in your own mind and so for some your conscience might not allow you to participate for others your conscience might allow it paul's talking about disputable matters he's talking about matters of conscience he's not saying that sin is a matter of personal opinion. Make sure you understand that. He was not teaching as long as we think something's okay, it's okay. He's not suggesting that truth is relative or that morality is defined by whatever person's conscience says it is. There are some things that are just wrong. The Bible teaches that. Some things are relative to the individual, but some things are just wrong. Sometimes we have to choose between what's clearly right and what's clearly wrong. But oftentimes we have to wrestle between what we call matters of conscience or these disputable matters. And that's when it becomes a problem because it can be easy for people in church to, to fight over those things. And so the command that he gives us in Romans 14 is abstainers don't pass judgment on those who don't feel like they have to abstain. And participators... Don't pass judgment on those who just don't, for matters of conscience, feel like they can. We don't have to give an account to each other. In fact, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. God is the one that's a judge on this matter. We don't have to account for each other we don't have to pass judgment on each other because God is our judge. We can have different conclusions on disputable matters. Let me say it again. We can have differing opinions on disputable matters. Now, probably a key verse in this whole chapter is verse 13. Paul says, therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. 
Stop passing judgment. We, we've already kind of talked about that. We've, we've got to quit doing this just because somebody thinks differently about a matter that's really not the most significant thing. And so, again, if you're taking notes with me, let's say it this way. The gospel resets us from passing judgment to showing preference. It resets us from passing judgment to showing preference. It's easy to look at people and the choices that they make and to think that they are less than us when it comes to faith. And so participators can look down on the abstainers and they can say, well, I feel sorry for those people whose faith is so weak. They can't even take joy in all the things that God has created and has given us. And abstainers, on the other hand, they can look at other people and they go, I feel sorry for those people that are so immature in their faith and they do all this stuff that they shouldn't do because I'm convinced I shouldn't do it. And again, Paul says, quit passing judgment and start showing preference. It's not about us. Christianity is never about us. It's about putting others before yourself. So I, I've got friends, multiple friends that, you know, would probably fall in the vegetarian variety, right? I, I, that's far opposite of me, but, uh, you know, they, they choose to, to not eat meat. And some of them are even vegans. And so, you know, if I were to go to their house or, or if they were to go to my house or if we were to go out to eat, uh, because of my beliefs and because of my uh, showing preference, I, I would never order and eat a prime rib in front of them. I, I would just never do it. I might, I might be tempted to do that, but I, I would never do that. I, I might, if we were out to eat, uh, order something that had some meat in it, but I would just be cautious. I wouldn't flaunt it. If I, if I had them over to my house, I would fix something that would be suitable for their diet. I would make sure there was something that they were comfortable with. I would never do or encourage them to do something that would go against their convictions. Why would I do something intentionally that would hurt someone? Now, here's the rest of verse 13. We didn't read it. He says, let us stop passing judgment on others. Instead, make up your mind not to put a stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. And so let's say it this way in our notes. The gospel resets us from asserting our individual freedoms to accommodating our brothers or our sisters' concerns. We go from uh, just being worried about our freedom to being accommodating to other Christians and their concerns. In doing that, Paul uses two words. One of them is a stumbling block, which means simply a trap, a means by which someone is brought to their end. That's kind of what a trap is, like a trap that might trap an animal. And so picture a Christian whose reckless behavior and use of their freedoms negatively influences a new Christian. I mean, that, that would be throwing a trap in their way. Paul cautions against that. He also cautions about an obstacle, an obstacle simply a hazard that can be tripped over. So picture a Christian who is loving life, enjoying their freedom in Christ when suddenly, uh, you know, a, a legalistic Christian puts their foot out in front of them and trips them up. Paul says, don't, don't, don't be either of those. We care about other people. We care about our brothers and sisters. Be aware of the potential effect that your actions have on others, and you adjust your behavior accordingly. Now, when he uses those words, obstacle and stumbling block, I want you to take notice. He's, he's not saying that if it bothers somebody else, He's talking about more serious than that, not just that it bothers somebody else, not that it's just not their preference. That, that, that's not enough, Paul says. We don't have to as Christians, you know, live in this kind of existence where we're trapped by weaker Christians. He's not saying that. He doesn't mean that we have to re refrain from everything that upsets someone else. Okay, it, it, there's, there's some balance here. It's just that we are accommodating and we are cautious and we do care about other people's convictions. Okay, verse 22. Whatever you believe about these things, listen to this. Keep between yourself and God. 
whatever you believe about it, you just keep it between yourself and God. Keep your, keep your views to yourself. If, if you're an abstainer, don't be so sensitive. Don't be so, you know, uh, prickly that, that everyone else has to, has to share your beliefs. If they don't, you're concerned about it. Keep it to yourself. Don't go around telling everyone else what you do and what you don't do. It's not your job to be a crusader for abstaining or participating in whatever it is in this, in, in this disputable matter. You make your decision. Don't get your feelings hurt when someone disagrees with you. On the other hand, if you're a participator, don't make others feel bad because they can't by conscience do what you do. Don't, don't look down on them. Don't put a stumbling block on them. You, you be sensitive. In other words, don't poke other people in the eye with your freedoms. Don't be just so overt about it that you're insensitive to other people. Now, I know what you're thinking because I'm thinking it. Thinking to yourself, that's hard to know how to do this. I mean, this is tough stuff. This is, this is difficult to do. And guess what? That's why it has a whole chapter in the Bible on it. Because this thing of Christianity and the way that we, we, we uh, engage other people, specifically Christians around us, it is a tension that is not easily resolved. And so in essence, what Paul is saying is, let one another be. Let one another be. Christians don't need others to lecture them or to become their self-appointed life coach. You know, most of us Christians, we already have all kinds of changes that we'd like to see in our behaviors already. And having somebody, you know, add their own list to ours, it really, really doesn't help. And so Paul said, just, just let other people be what God has called them to be and to the, to the conscience, matters of conscience that God has uh, convicted them in their own heart. But he does say this in verse 19 and 20. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Listen, everything that you do, let, let, let's try to live peaceably. Paul's already said that earlier. In, in whatever you can do about it, however you can do, live at peace with other people. And then he, he, he makes this point. Don't destroy what God is doing for some crazy insignificant matter like food or like drink or like special days don't fight over these disputable matters you know jesus told a story about two men two guys one of them he called a pharisee and you know what a pharisee was probably in jesus day the ultimate abstainer right I mean, they, they had a list a mile long of things that they couldn't do. They were still writing the book on things that they couldn't do. They, they, had, they had it just so far divided out. They abstained from lots and lots of things and had all kinds of lists and rules. So there was this Pharisee that was an abstainer. The other person Jesus tells us about in this story in Luke 18 is about a tax collector. And most often the tax collector in the first century was what we would consider probably the ultimate participator right I mean he was a sinner he was a, a self-proclaimed sinner and so he had been engaged and involved in all kinds of things and so he, he didn't care that he didn't have any maybe religious uh, upbringing maybe there was no context for him and so he was the ultimate participator in thing and it tells us that they both they both began to pray and 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 this Pharisee he he went and he kind of did it in a way where everybody could hear him and he says thank you God that I'm not like that sinner over there pointing to the tax collector and the tax collector on the other hand said God have mercy on me a sinner and Jesus said listen I want you to have the attitude like that one that one who humbly admits that he's a sinner. Listen, all of us, this is what Paul said, all of us are a bunch of sinners that are saved by Jesus. Let's focus on that. That's the big thing. We're all a bunch of sinners. We're all just a bunch of beggars that found bread and we're telling other people about it. Let's quit getting stuck in the weeds and let's make sure we make the most important things the most important thing. And that's what Jesus has done for us. Don't fight over the disputable matters. We're just a bunch of sinners saved by Jesus. Pray with me. Father, thank you for teaching us today.
from this incredible chapter in the, the Ro Roman letter. God, thank you for reminding us of the things that are more important. And God, I'm praying that we would be rock solid on those indisputable matters. Would you help us to camp out, to, you know, to, to fasten ourselves, to anchor into those, those things. And Father, I'm praying that we, we would be the most gracious people around when it came to the disputable matters. Would you help us to give lots of leeway like you? Father, would you help us in our own hearts where we have uh, uh, convictions on uh, matters of conscience? God, would you help us to stay convicted? Just help us not to push it off on other people. And Father, would you help us all just not to judge one another, but to live fully for you? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.